So good morning class. Today we want to look at product and product life cycle. So we start by looking at what is a product. According to Kotler, it is anything that is offered to a market for attention, for use, consumption, or acquisition that might satisfy a need or a want. Anything that is offered to a market for attention, for acquisition, for use or consumption that might satisfy a need or a want. In our layman terms, we say that is anything tangible that or anything one can feel, one can touch, one can handle that is offered to a market to satisfy a need or a want. So that is the product. And uh, we want to look at the product life cycle, but we need to understand a few concepts. One of such is branding. What is branding? It's a name, a term, a symbol, a logo, a color, a design, or a combination of all these to identify or to differentiate one product from the other. A name, a term, a slogan, a symbol, a color, a logo, a design or a combination of all these to separate, sorry, to identify or differentiate one product from the other. So we can have Hens as a brand, we can have Gucci, we can have uh, MTN as a brand, and we can have yellow, uh, uh, yellow, the color yellow as a brand, red as a brand or Vodafone or um, uh, we can have the logo when you see the uh, TV3 logo revolving during uh, 7 p.m. news, you know that you don't need to know the station. Once you see the logo revolving, you know that is TV3. Or you see the logo on a car, you know that this branded car is for TV3. Um, a slogan, MCN everywhere you go, that is a slogan. So that is a brand. And as human beings, we can also brand ourselves. How do we brand ourselves? What do we stand for? What makes us different from others? How are we able to differentiate ourselves from others? How, how do people, how, how do we brand ourselves so that people can easily identify us? That is brand or branding. Then we can look at packaging, which says that it involves the activities of um, designing or the container or a wrapper for a product. Designing the container or the wrapper for a product. That is packaging. And packaging gives one product uh, an advantage over the other. Sometimes it's not about the product. It's how well packaged the product is. That makes the product attractive to others. So if I come into your wardrobe, I'm sure to find a lot of... Um, containers you don't want to throw away. Why? Because it's so attractive to you and you have even used it for other purposes and for some of you it's just decorative. That is what packaging can do. Then we also have labeling. What is labeling? It, is a, it, it ranges from a simple tag to complex graphics that are attached to products. A simple tag to complex graphics that are attached to products. And the essence of labeling is to provide information and then also for identification. Provide information such as country of origin, uh, uh, um, country of manufacture, um, expiry date, um, ingredients used, um, who to use the product and when to use the product, um, not for lactating mothers, um, not for lactating mothers, not for children and, uh, and uh, a certain age, um, not for those who are allergic to certain products, etc. So the labeling should provide enough information. Um, do not use when the seal is broken. Um, do not use seven days after, re -op after opening. Uh, make sure you keep in a cool, dry place. Make sure it is in a refrigerator etc. The labeling gives you specific instructions to obey. So that is labeling. So we have looked at uh, products, we have looked at branding, we have looked at packaging, and we have also looked at labeling. Now let's move on straight to the product life cycle. What is the product life cycle? It is a cycle that every product goes through 
from the point of uh, development, product development, till the product declines from the market. Just like human beings are conceived, they are born, they grow, they mature, they die. Products also go through the same phase. Product development, they are developed in the, in the minds of people, first as a concept before it is produced finally as a product. And that is known as the product development stage. And it can be likened to the human being that is conceived in the mother's womb and grows and goes through a process till nine months and it is delivered. And that is the product development stage. At that stage, ideas are tossed, uh, we add, we subtract, we think through, we brainstorm before finally the product comes out. There's no sales here. Point of sale is zero. It's rather a lot of investment. So that is the product development stage. Then we move on to the introduction stage. Here the product is introduced onto the market. There's a lot of hula baloo about the product. People go out there to talk about the product, flaunt the product, uh, go on floats to uh, create awareness about the product. And this is known as the introduction stage. Here there's no profit. Sales is usually very slow, very relatively insignificant. There's no profit. Um, it's just noise making and creating awareness. And it's just like a, a, a little baby who has been born. Um, this is the outdooring period where the mother shows the baby to the world that a newborn baby has entered into the world and uh, people make fun and merry. There's a lot of merry making, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of uh, awareness creation about the birth of the child. And it's the same thing that applies to products. And this is known as the introductory stage. Then we move on to the growth stage. Here, the product gradually receives acceptance in the market and begins to um, catch the attention of many. Here, the uh, market share is captured, a large market, a large or a certain market share is captured and that is what is known as the growth stage. So the growth can be truncated as well or stunted depending on a lot of factors in the environment. The environment can be very hostile sometimes and be unfavorable to the product. The competition in itself can make or unmake the product and the product can be stunted. The growth of the product can't really be stunted. Some products just get to the growth stage and they not make it and they fizzle out or they die. Then we have the maturity stage or the mature stage where the product has captured a certain market share and is now stagnant. It does not move forward, it does not move backward. The market share is the same and uh, that is what we call the maturity stage. And if companies do not do something about their products at this stage, then the product may die. The product may die, mature, you have reached your peak, you are no more attractive. Those who use, you use. Those who don't use, will use. There's nothing that you can do to gain more customers. So the company must set up and say, no, what can I do to make my product more attractive? It's just going, going down, 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 down the drain. What can I do to make my products attractive? So you find out that some companies modify their products or they improve their products or some even change the packaging of their products. I think recently, um, is it Fanta or um, a certain product changed the bottle? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, they yeah. changed the bottle. Or I, I think I saw they will make something different about the bottle. It's just the bottle. Yeah. Is it a plastic bottle? The bottle, the bottle itself. I think it was Fanta. They, they actually changed the bottle. Now you see that even Coke, they have the big size, they have the small size, they have the very tiny size. Yes. Uh -huh. So they will do something about the product that will make the product more attractive. Um, if you take yogurt, Yogurt got stagnant at a point. Nobody was buying yogurt anymore. So the same still strawberry yogurt. But now they have cocoa pine, they have funky banana, they have uh, 
what mango yogurt, they have mango. the super yogurt they have passion fruits they have a lot of flavors and people just want to try so people just keep buying 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 and that is what we we mean by improving the product if you look at uh, geisha um, geisha now has different fragrances we have aloe vera we have a uh, shea butter we have uh, coconuts we have lemon we have different different yes so i mean you must introduce something exciting that will make consumers sit up and say i want to give it a try even aloe vera and eh, sorry eh, oh, why have i forgotten this drink alvaro alvaro yes alvaro also came up with the pear and uh, passion fruits and a lot of flavors so you don't sit down and say that oh this is all my product is about and therefore i live into faith and my product can die no you must set up think through what the customer needs are and come up with variety and satisfy the needs and wants of customers so that's the mature state then here the competition is very keen and you must be able to penetrate the market if not your products will die and that's what we call the decline stage it's a period of complete withdrawal from the market or it's a period when sales fall off completely now nobody wants to buy your product how many products have been died just think about it how many products are no more in the market we used to have a uh, refresh we used to have pokey we used to have uh, you name them a lot of products now they are no more on the market even uh, nokia what is it 3310 no no uh, nokia 3310 is no more on the market we we call it timber log it's no more on the market so all the products a lot of products have died because the manufacturers or the companies do not set up to say that what can we do to the product we won't allow it to die you see how apple is coming up fast 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 with the product apple doesn't want its products to die so before uh apple whatever how do you call it max pro 11 is oh before you get used to it another one has come <laughs> they don't want their product to die and the features are so tiny I mean, if you look at the difference, you, you won't even see. Recently, I heard that now the Apple uh, phone, phone, the iPhone that is, has come, doesn't have a charger. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, what is all this? <laughs> and that for them is an innovation. It shouldn't have a charger. Upgrading. Upgrading. Really? Mm -hmm. Like, seriously? But why? But that, that is it. I mean, the competition is king. We must come out with something. So I have an iPhone and I don't have a charger. Excuse me, please. I have an iPhone and I have to buy my music. Excuse me, please. I have an iPhone and I can't... Uh, 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 how do I say it? Uh, can I transfer pictures? You can't. So what's the sense of the iPhone then? It's just that you have a, an iPhone and you're holding it and you, are, you feel you have a swag and you're holding it and yet you, you don't have a lot of features. But that is what the product is all about. That is what the product is all about. So if you don't take care, the product will die. The product will die. So this is the product life cycle. This is the, the various stages that products go through. And uh, But surprisingly, do you know that not all products go through this life cycle? Can you think of a product that not goes through this life cycle or a product that does not die or it's not dead yet let me say that think about it the product does not do anything to itself there's no modification there's no improvement and yet the product is not dead just think about it gary gary is still surviving I don't want to use that example, but Akpetechin. <laughs> it has not done anything to Akpetechin. has not done branding. has not done rebranding. It, it does not even advertise. And yet it has survived all the competition in the market. Most of us are not able to survive the competition in the market. I'm sure some of you are asking yourself, well, why, why, why did I come back to school? <laughs> see the number of assignments I have. See the number of eyes I have. I am just tired, and you are you have 
you just lifted your hands up in the air in desperation but even the products out there are able to survive all the hostility and the competition i admire i always say i admire key soap so much see the the, the struggle key soap ha has had to go through all these years your grandmother's time to your mother's time to your time and it will even stay to your children today they say kiss of and have you realized that kiss of has not done anything to its uh, fragrance it's still the same a kiss of has survived i remember the few promotions they ran they put a key in key soap and they said that if you are able to find the key then you get a certain number of cloth or something we all went out there buying key soap can you imagine i wonder who got that key but the company did not allow key soap to die so key soap survives all the competition it survives the rain it survives the sun it survives the uh, uh, whatever some products out there fade. The packaging fades. Some of them, the packaging gets torn because they're exposed to rain. Some of them, they, because they're exposed to the sun, the packaging fades. Some lose their elasticity. They are so they are not supposed to be out there in the hot sun, but uh, they have no choice. And yet they go through. And you, you go through some small wahala in school. No, you say, Madam, I'm tired. I'm going back home. Going where? anyway so this is the product life cycle we go through new product development we go through introduction we go through growth and maturity and decline so let's move on to service marketing service marketing the nature and characteristics of a service what is a service we have spoken about products that they are tangible but what is a service? A service is a flow of activities or benefits that are offered for sale. A flow of activities or benefits that are offered for sale. For example, the airline, medical, legal, teaching, they are all services and they are offered for sale. Now, what's the nature and characteristic of a service? We have four characteristics. The first one is that a service is intangible a service is intangible it means that you cannot touch you cannot feel you cannot handle a service now because of the intangible nature of a service there are cues that uh, uh, we look out for there are cues that we need to put in place when we are rendering a service and they help people to draw conclusions as to whether the service that they are being rendered will be uh, quality or not. So if you go into a hospital, if you go into a bank, what are the things that you expect to see? They are intangible. You can't touch them, but they create an indelible impression on you and you know that I am going to get a good service. So when I enter a, a bank, Tell me, when you enter a bank, what are the things that you look out for? You don't know them. You've never been there before. But you expect that you get a good service. There are some cues. There are some things that you look out for. What are the things that you look out for? I will look out for the floor. Is the floor speak and span? The chairs, are they well arranged? For now, I will look out for, before I even enter, I will look out for the signage. No nose mask, no entry. I went to the bank this morning and I forgot my nose mask. And as I, as I approached the bank, I felt that I was the only odd one out and I didn't know what was wrong. Then it just came to mind that, hey, you're not wearing a nose mask. I was far away from my car. I was like, should I go inside the bank or I should just go back to my car and pick a nose mask? And I just told myself, why am I exposing myself to so much risk and thinking that COVID is not out there? So quickly I went back to my car and picked and, and pick the nose mask. I didn't even get to the bank to look out for notification. 
I, I, I felt that I'll be too embarrassed if I was told to go and, and wear a nose mask. So the first thing I'll look out for is no, no, no nose mask, no entry. Then I will also look out for a sanitizer or a bowl or something to wash my hands. If it is not there, I will just tell myself, these people, they are not serious. Having they heard about COVID, then when I enter, I will see whether the social distancing, how are the chairs arranged. It's a, once there's, they are well spaced, then I know that these people, they are serious. Then I'll look out for the uh, tellers, how they are dressed, and whether they are in their nose mask, and whether they have sanitizers by them. Look out for the fun, the neatness of the place, how they are dressed, etc. All these will create an impression in my mind that I'm at a good place and that this is not a COVID infested bank. Yeah. Then the second characteristic of a, of a, a service is that it is inseparable. Inseparable. Why? Services are produced and consumed simultaneously. And so services cannot be separated from the service provider. A service cannot be separated from the service provider. So if I go into a bank and the teller is good to me, I will say that the service was good. If the teller was nasty to me, I'll say the service was bad. So you can't separate a service from the service provider. If you pick a taxi and the, the Uber driver, if you pick an Uber and the Uber driver is nice to you, you come out feeling good that, oh, this was a good service. If it was nasty to you, maybe you even tell him, hey, can you stop for me to get down? Because this is bad service. So you can't separate the service from the service provider. Then another characteristic is that the service is variable. It means that the quality of service rendered depends on who provides the service. Who? When the service is provided. When? where the service is provided and how the service is provided. So who provides the service, when the service is provided, and how the service is provided. Who provides the service? Who? The personality. Who is providing the service? When is the service being provided? The timing. The timing. Where is the service provided? Lectures must be provided in the lecture room. Where? Don't tell me that the teacher said I should come to his house. To do what? So that he will teach me. Excuse me. Lectures are held in the lecture room. Where? And how? So, variable. The quality of service rendered depends on who is providing the service when the service is being provided, where and how the service is being provided. That is the how the service is variable. Then the last one is perishability. Does the service perish? Can the service perish? Yes. Even though the service is not a tangible product, the service is perishable. It means that the service cannot be stored for later use. The service cannot be stored for later use. So if you miss it, you miss it. If you miss it, you miss it. So you are supposed to see a doctor at a particular time. If you miss it, you have missed it. You will go another time, but you have missed the first encounter, that first experience, you have missed it. So a service cannot be stored for later use. Sometimes we say that, um in ghana in ghana uh we don't charge for missed appointments but elsewhere if you book an appointment and you are not able to go you are charged for it if you don't call to cancel the appointments you are charged for it 
So you have to say, see a dentist, you book an appointment and you don't go and you don't care. You, you, have, you have to pay for the missed appointment because the doctor or the dentist came in, sat down and waited for you hours on end and you did not turn up. So you have to pay for it. So that is uh, perishability. So these are just four of the characteristics of a service. Now let's look quickly look at uh, marketing strategies that service organizations use. The first one is the service profit chain. The service profit chain. And it has seven links under that. The first link is that every service organization should have internal service quality. Internal service quality. It means that even in the organization, we must be deal with each other as if we are customers to each other. And therefore, we must be nice. We must ensure that there's internal service quality. You are not rude to your fellow colleague at work. You are treating your fellow colleague at work like you would treat a customer. So ensure that there's internal service quality. And how do you ensure that? By making sure that we recruit the right people. The right people. We recruit the right people. We recruit the right people who are people-oriented and people-centered. Because you are in a service organization and you are going to render service and you are going to show your teeth 24-7. And so if you are not people-oriented, then that's not the place for you. Some of us are not people-oriented. That's also not to say that we are bad people. It means that we are just not uh, enthused about uh, smiling and showing our teeth and being nice all the time. Some of us are just back office people. We want to sit at the back and do our calculations and, and uh, sit behind our computers and work 24-7. Yes, we need all that to make the world an interesting place. And therefore, you must know who you are. What are your strengths? Conduct a SWOT analysis on yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are the opportunities available to you? And what are the threats? So what are your strengths? Tell me. Are you a happy-go-lucky person? Are you a persuasive person? Are you like smiling? You like talking? I, I once spoke to a gentleman, I think recently. I said, how did you know you wanted to be a journalist? He said, oh, madam, from class one, I like talking. I just like talking. And so I decided to channel my talking into positive views. And that's why I'm a journalist, because I can talk 24-7. I can talk from morning to evening. That is a strength. Some of us can't talk. Some of us are not public speakers. Some of us are writers. So you must know who you are and what your strengths are. Who are you and what are your strengths? Are you a public speaker? Can you stand in front of people? Of people? Some of us can't stand in front of people. Some of us can't even MC a program. Some of us can't hold a mic without shivering. And yet we are the very people who laugh at those who go and stand there. And yet when you are given a mic, if you don't take care, we will have to carry you to the hospital. So internal service quality. If you are going into a service industry, service company you must know what it takes that you're always going to show your teeth you're always going to be nice even when you're in pain you still have to put up a, a pleasant uh, count appearance and, and just be nice to somebody so internal service quality and once you have that it will rub off on you and on other customers it will rub off on the people that you work with and therefore, the whole environment will be good. Then that leads to satisfied and productive service employees. Yes, if we are all happy and we are all going about our, our duties very happily, then we will be satisfied and we will be very productive. We will be satisfied and will be productive. It will create a lot. The next one is that it will create service value. We will put premium on what we are doing and we will give our best. 
and that will lead to satisfying the loyal customers. Definitely, if you give your best to a customer, that's, that, that customer becomes a loyal customer and is satisfied. And every time that customer is looking out for you because you give your best, when that, when, when that customer comes to you, you make him or her feel like a king or a queen. And they remain loyal. They will always look for you. And that will bring about healthy profits. So the service profit chain starts with internal service quality. That, that means that recruiting the right people, conducting a SWOT analysis to get the right people to fill the right positions and creating a good ambience in the office Two, leading to satisfied and productive service employees. Three, creating service value for satisfied and loyal customers five healthy service profits and goods now the second marketing strategy for a service industry is managing service quality managing service quality so organizations can differentiate themselves by delivering consistently higher quality than our competitors and this can be achieved by improving our frontline executives, by equipping them with authority, responsibility, and incentives. So you manage the service quality. You equip your frontliners with a lot of authority, uh, responsibility, and incentives. I know that the, in, in the banks, the tellers are paid extra because they deal with money. And they are also paid fortnightly. So they make sure that they don't lack money because they are dealing with money. And if they lack money and they are poor and they are not able to pay their rent and they don't have food to eat, they will definitely dip their hands in their, in their money. That's also not to say it's right. But that will, that's what will happen. So there are lots of incentives in the bank. If you look at the bankers, they are well paid. They are giving loans for housing and their cars, etc. And therefore, they seem to be ahead of their colleagues' incentives. And uh, they must also be given some authority, the frontliners. They must be given some authority. So if the security man tells you, park here, and you don't park, he should have the authority to say, drive out. They should be given some kind of authority. But... If they, are, they don't have any authority and they say, can you park here? You say, no, I'll park here. And they don't have authority. Then, why are they there? They should have some authority. So, managing our service quality means that we must uh, be able to differentiate ourselves from other organizations when it comes to our service. And we must also be able to... Uh, um, we must also be able to ensure that our frontliners are equipped, well equipped with incentives, with uh, uh, authority, and with uh, responsibility. They must also have some kind of responsibility. They shouldn't just sit there. They must know what they are there to do. Another service strategy is to manage the service productivity. How do we ensure that we manage service Productivity. We can do this in so many ways. A few are that we can train our current employees better or hire new ones who are better qualified and equipped and who work more skillfully. Um, it's a two-way um, it's a, it's a two thing. You either train those or you already have or you employ new ones who are better qualified. Um, if you look at the um, GCB, Commercial Bank, they used to have a lot of um, old women at the counter wearing their goggles and looking at you through their goggles. And that did not create a good image for them. When they tried rebranding, they took all the old women off and brought very young, pretty, smart-looking, highly qualified girls to occupy those positions. As a way of rebranding, you know, making the institution more customer friendly. 
this old woman is tired. Then you want her to smile. Mm -hmm. She she's buckled down with uh, uh, so many issues, and uh, she can't come and be showing her teeth twenty four seven. The other thing is that the provider can also industrialize the service by adding modern equipment. Modern equipment. So when I come to your organization, I must see modern. I must see flat screen. Uh, laptops or computers, I must see swivel chairs, I must see uh, automated doors, uh, dispensers or uh, sanitizers, whatever. I must see modern facilities in your office. And then I must also harness the power of technology to save time and costs. The power of technology. Here we are now using technology all over. And uh, now for a lot of things, you don't have to walk in. You just need their email or, or uh, their telephone number. Then you can quickly uh, liaise with them and get whatever you want. So basically, that is what uh, just a few of the strategies where um, service industries are concerned. Now, I want you to practice this question in relation to services. It says, narrate any service encounter you've had and discuss it in relation to the service characteristics. Any service encounter you've had, and I'm sure most of you have had encounters. Everybody, everybody, not most of you, everybody has had a, a service encounter. Either you went to the bank or even ordered an uh, Uber or you went to a restaurant, even went to a hairdresser, uh, you sat in a lecture. Everybody's had a service encounter. So narrate it. Any service encounter you've had and discuss it in relation to the service characteristics. So I think that will draw the curtain here. And uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, we'll see you soon. And uh, we'll have our presentations as well. Thank you very much and enjoy a COVID-free weekend or week. All the best. Thank you.